Why do we care about stuff? March of 2010, my mother was dying of cancer. This glass sat on her nightstand. At one point, I reached over, lifted her head up off the pillows. And with this, I gave her the last drink of water she would ever have. A few hours later, she would slip into a coma. And a few days later, she'd simply slip away. Hospice told us, they said, you can prepare your mind, but your heart is never ready. My sister Jada and I found this to be all too true. We closed the door to my mother's bedroom, put a note on there, asking the family, please leave everything as it is. And this became a haven for us. This was a place we could go to just to sit with our own thoughts and cry. Or it was a place we could go into and talk about growing up and share stories about my mother and feel closer to her. It was almost a year before we could go back into that room to begin to move forward. This glass was sitting on her nightstand. It was empty. I knew what was going to happen when I reached out to pick it up. The moment my fingers touched it, I was taken back to that moment and that last drink of water. I didn't expect what happened next. The last three days of her life hit me in a rush, complete with every single emotion. How many of you feel really bad for me right now? I'm going to let you off the hook. I bought that two days ago. <clears throat> The story about my mother was absolutely true. Every bit of that's true. Had nothing to do with the glass. But because I put a story into an inanimate object, you cared about it. To the point that when I dropped that, you gave me your sympathy. But before I dropped that glass, you gave me something infinitely more valuable. You gave me your empathy. This was no longer my story. This was our story. Because all of you were searching through your experiences to find something similar. As a result, all of your stories and my story got together and intertwined. And we became connected emotionally. In the book Emotional Marketing, which by the way was written by the leaders of the Hallmark Loyalty Marketing Group. And who knows emotions better than Hallmark, right? Have you watched these Christmas movies? That's probably what my wife is doing now instead of watching me. I'm just saying, all right? <laughs> but in the book, it says that emotions stimulate the brain 3,000 times faster than regular thought. In many situations, emotion will move someone to act well before the rational brain has had a chance to catch up. That explains those love stories, doesn't it? Right? You've fallen in love before, you know what I'm talking about. We are hardwired here and here for stories. It begins in the womb when they read stories to you. It continues in the room when they read stories to you. Imagine this. A seven-year-old comes running into the room. They've got on their PJs. They've had their bath. They've brushed their teeth. They've got their stuffed animal in their hands. They jump into the bed. They tuck in the stuffed animal. They pull the covers up. They prop up on their pillow with an elbow like this. And they're looking right at you. You have never had more attention than you've got right now from this seven-year-old child as you reach up and take a book off the shelf. As you bring it down, their eyes light up, the room fills with anticipation, and you go, that's a solid book right there. Look at that. That spine, you ever seen stitching like this, kid? This is awesome. Those pages, that is heavy gauge paper right there. I'm telling you, this is a quality book right here. Those illustrations, look at those. Those are beautiful, aren't they? That artist should be winning awards every time they turn around. And oh my goodness, Helvetica type. Who uses that anymore, right? <laughs> that is awesome right there. What happened? You just told this kid about the product, but you never told the kid the story. And what happened? You just lost your audience of one right there in that bedroom. Is the same thing happening in your boardroom? Stories have the ability to motivate and influence both personally and professionally. And you may think to yourself, Lewis, I'm nobody. My stories don't matter. 
to anybody. I promise you, your stories matter to somebody. Your stories have the ability to change minds, to change hearts, to change lives, the same way stories have done for you from other people. You cannot escape the influence of stories. Watch TV, that's all it is. Even the commercials have stories, right? And if they're done well enough, they can get the attention of a 16-year-old multitasking teen. When my oldest son, Spencer, was that age, he's watching TV, he's watching a show he'd seen, never seen before, rather. He flips over to another channel when the commercial comes on, but that's not enough. He has an earbud in, he's listening to music, and he's texting at the same time. The kid could do seven texts a minute, 21,000 texts a month, I know because I paid the bill. When the commercial is over on the channel he flipped away from, he'll flip back. That way he misses no entertainment value, right? Okay. This was his routine. I'm sitting here watching. At one point, two commercials stopped him dead in his tracks. The first one, it's this polar bear on an ice flow, and it's going down the water, looking really sad and pathetic. And the announcer comes on at the end and says, please, won't you help us feed the starving polar bear? That was followed immediately by one of the commercials we've all seen, one of the most heartfelt commercials you can ever see about the starving children. At the end of which the guy says, please won't you help us feed the starving children? I'm watching Spencer. For 30 seconds, this kid doesn't do anything. I can see the wheels turning. Suddenly he goes, Dad, I can solve both of these problems. I'm like, I've raised a genius <laughs> on my wife's side, but I've raised a genius. Because in 30 seconds, he's about to solve world hunger on two different levels. I said, son, please enlighten me. He said, well, dad, you feed the starving kids to the polar bears. <laughs> no, don't think so, son. But thanks for playing the game. Storytelling, when done well, does that. And you need to be able to do that as well. When you're telling stories, one of the first things you have to do is know you have to be a good public speaker. And guess what? Everybody in here, you are a public speaker. You don't have to be standing up here in this red circle for that to happen. If you're in a meeting and you're trying to convince somebody of your way of thinking, you're sharing an idea, maybe you're doing a presentation, guess what? You're a public speaker. You're in sales, doesn't matter whether you're on the streets, whether you're in the office. You are a public speaker. Maybe you belong to a civic organization. You have to give them ideas, right? You have fundraisers. You have to take it out to this community and show them what you've got. You are a public speaker. In order to be a good public speaker, the first thing you have to do is get rid of what's called filler words. These are the words that come out of your mouth when you don't know what it is you want to say. Words like, uh, um, well... But, so, like, and, happens all the time. I don't call these filler words. I call them killer words because I'm pioneering the idea that not only do they hurt your reputation, and they do, but they kill the single most valuable asset you have, and that is your time. When I set out to prove this, I went to the Internet. I started looking at all sorts of videos and interviews. Didn't take me long to realize I was on to something. One caught my attention right off. An interview, a lady was representing her company. She's on this interview for five minutes at the most. I went in and took that and recorded it, edited it down, took out the interviewer, left just this lady talking. She spoke for three minutes and 11 seconds. In that three minutes and 11 seconds, she had over 70 of these killer words and phrases in there. I decided to take this to another level. So I took out everything she said except for those filler words. And it sounds like this. Um, um, and, or, uh, and so, and, um, 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 and, and, um, and so, and so, um, um, and so, um, 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 I, uh, um, uh, um, and so, um, and then, um, but, um, and so, um, um, and then that, like, right. um, somebody, um, 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 that, um, um, and so, um, um, so, um, 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 uh, um, so, 
um, the and um, 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 and um, so that um, uh, don't. That was excruciating, wasn't it? <laughs> like nails on a chalkboard, right? And that, I know there's some of you in here who are going, okay, Lewis, we got the point, turn it off. No, seriously, turn it off. Long before it got turned off, and that is only 37 seconds of time. Now I say only. But consider, she only spoke for 3 minutes and 11 seconds. This is 3 minutes and 11 seconds minus 37 that she ate up with useless words. If her company had to pay for her to be on this show, which a lot of times you have to do that nowadays, that means time was money in this case. Had she been speaking for 30 minutes, she would have lost over 6 minutes to these killer words and phrases. How many more stories could she have gotten in in that amount of time? What else could she have done? If you don't change these, you wind up looking unprepared, unprofessional, unfocused, completely. So how do you get rid of these? I'm going to teach you how. I call it stop, drop, and pause. You hear it coming, you know you're going to say it. So just stop, hush, be quiet. There's a reason silence is golden, because it's worth something, all right? I promise you, you get quiet, nobody's going to die, all right? Then you drop that word, and you simply pause. Pausing does two things. It allows the audience the opportunity to absorb what you've just said. It allows you the opportunity to get back on track with what it is you're trying to say. These are must-have soft skills. And the problem is, as software has increased, soft skills have gone down. When I was a kid, I used these to go up and down the back roads to get from town to town. Entire generations are now using these to get on the information superhighway and go from country to country around the globe like this. But the trade-off is... Doing this, being able to speak in front of people, to be able to convey an idea, to be able to get it across well, that's what's missing. If you're out there, and this is something that resonates with you, maybe you sound like the person that I played. Understand, having these skills can help you in a job interview. They can also help you in your career advancement, because I promise you, there are still bosses out there who are looking for people who have strong public speaking skills and who are storytellers. And if you think basic public speaking was enough, basic public speaking doesn't even fix this. Basic public speaking is just what its name implies. It's basic. And do you really want to go into an extraordinary opportunity with just basic skills? Where else do you apply that logic in anything else you do? Especially if you're in the succession line for the leadership at your work, right? They want somebody who can stand up and do this and give presentations. And Forbes posed the question, what is the value of a great presentation? The amount of the deal you're trying to win. What is the cost of a terrible presentation? Same thing. And I know people say, they fear public speaking more than death. Well, I'm here to tell you, you won't die from public speaking, but your deal might. Steve Jobs said, the storyteller is the most powerful person in the world. They set the value, the visions, and the agenda for an entire generation to come. And guys, this has been going on since the dawn of man, back when we were in caves and writing on the walls. The Bible is called the greatest story ever told. But if you take out all of the stories, what do you have left? Two covers. That's it. You need to be telling your stories. You need to be telling them well and listening to other stories, even if it's a story you don't necessarily want to hear. Like the night I called home. Told my wife I'm headed home. She says, when you get here, you can deal with your youngest son. When he's in trouble, he's my youngest son. I said, what did Evan do now? She goes, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm too mad. You'll have to talk to him when you get home. Bye. Click, hangs up. I get home. She's over here on the couch, foot doing this. Evan's over on the love seat. They're not even looking at each other. I walked over. I said, Evan, tell me a story. He proceeds to tell me about a bully that day in school who was picking on him and he'd had enough. He went to confront the bully. The bully stands up, pops off one more time, and Evan goes, pow! 
pops him right in the nose, breaks his nose. The kid goes backwards, knocks off three computers on the floor. They all break. As he continues to fall, bangs his head on the table. Now it's cut open. He's in the emergency room being sewn up. I've got a message on my computer from the teacher saying, we have to pay for the three laptops. The parents may be suing us. Evan's been suspended, and he's looking to be expelled, and this is my straight-A student. Do you hear the voice I'm getting now? This is what he got. I lit into him. Son, we did not teach you to do this. Where did this come from? You're smarter than this. You're better than this. Did you have your head with you today at any point? And I went through this breathlessly for half an hour till finally I looked at him and I said, Son, is there anything else you'd like to say before your mother and I decide what punishment fits this? And he stood up right here, eyeball to eyeball. I'm thinking this better be really good, kid. My son looks me right in the eyes, and he says, April Fool's, Dad. (laughs) Ah. (laughs) Hook, line, sinker, I took the whole thing. They worked it out for two months. The teacher was in on it. (laughs) Incredible. I told him that was great, but son, when your dad's in a rest home and you get a call that I've had a heart attack, (laughs) you might want to check the calendar. (laughs) You can do this with humor, guys. Humor is like a rubber sword. It allows you to make a point without drawing blood. Just understand that stories are the connective tissue of humans. Emotions are the destination. Your stories are the tickets. Take people on your journey and ask people to take you on their journey because this is about change. Everything changes. And someday, somebody you care very much about is going to be gone. Oh, you'll have some stuff that has sentimental value. But if you do what I'm talking about, you'll have something far better. You will have their stories indelibly written into the pages of your mind. Thank you all.